Thank you for joining me on another episode of She Leads Now, a podcast for women entrepreneurs and professionals who want to expand your innate leadership ability and influence, cultivate a culture of belonging and collaboration, develop others to perform at their greatest potential, and of course, live a life that is fulfilling, abundant, and impactful. I'm your host, Sabine Gideon. After nearly 14 years of climbing the corporate ladder as an HR professional and a leader, I became a corporate dropout and have spent the past several years helping organizations and leaders align their business goals with their talent strategies, strengthen their leadership bench, and create environments that employees actually want to be a part of. Tune in every Wednesday for insight, practical tools and strategies, as well as inspiring stories from other women leaders who have climbed the ropes and are now making a huge impact within their spheres of influence. Looking forward to chatting with you soon. Welcome to another episode of She Leads Now. I'm your host, Sabine Gideon, and I am so excited to be here with you this week, specifically because I am thrilled to bring on my guest and to have her share all her expertise and knowledge and wisdom with you. Nellie A. Kalp is a passionate entrepreneur. She's also a business expert and the mother of four. She's the CEO of CorpNet.com, a trusted resource and service provider for business and corporation, LLC filings, corporate compliance, and payroll tax registration services in all 50 states. I'm really thrilled to bring Nellie on to share her journey and to share her story and some of the pitfalls and do's and don'ts that she's supported other small business entrepreneurs with. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Nellie. Thank you so much for having me, Sabine. Really excited to be here and to share my journey with your audience. Yes. Same here. So before we get into what you do today and how you're supporting small businesses and organizations, tell us about your journey because you've been in this entrepreneurial space for a while. And I know that takes a lot of grit and a lot of tenacity. Help us understand what brought you to this place. I'm actually considered an oldie right now. <laughs> I've been in this Seasoned. So Seasoned. Much. Thank you. Thank you. So I got into the entrepreneurial space right out of law school back in 1997. My husband and I were attending law school at the time and looking around to see what kind of job we're going to, you know, secure after graduating law school to pay our student loans. And in, in looking around, we realized that the entry level salaries as to what a lawyer would get paid is not going to be able to support the lifestyle that we were envisioning for ourselves. So my husband was really doing poorly in his corporations class in law school, but always had this real big interest in doing stuff on the computer. And he's a techie. He's a total tech nerd and really loved and had a really big passion for computers and always was helping his parents' businesses with automating things. So he came up the, with the idea of taking what he was learning in his corporations class and offering seamless solutions for business owners to start businesses online. And it was a really great timing because it was at the time where it was the birth of the internet. So it was ripe for us to get into a market whereby, you know, you can gain market share immediately. So we started our first company, literally with a hundred dollar investment, that company soon grew to doing a million dollars in gross revenues. Fast forward to 2005, and then we were approached and blessed with the opportunity of being acquired by a publicly traded companies. So in 2005, we sold our first document filing service, took some time off, focused on our then three growing children. And then fast forward to 2009, we realized we were too passionate and frankly, too young and too bored to take on an early retirement. And um, I've always been one of those people who can't really sit still. I always have to be doing something. So 
I decided to push my husband to start another document filing service because truly helping other small business owners in, you know, starting and growing their businesses has always been a passion for me. In 2009, after our non-compete ran out with our previous company, we decided to launch CorpNet, which is our current company, and CorpNet was born. And here at CorpNet, our mission is to educate, support, and help business professionals and entrepreneurs in business. Our goal is to offer them the most comprehensive, cost-effective services when it comes to either themselves wanting to start or expand a business or keep it in compliance, or if it's a business professional such as a lawyer, a financial advisor, a business consultant, or a CPA who's representing clients in wanting to start a business or maintain their business in compliance. And we offer the businesses in all 50 states. We're proud of where CorpNet started in 2009 and where it has come to today. You know, today I'm proud to say that we're a multi-million dollar company with over 100 employees and There's a lot to be said about that, especially during the economic climate that we've been through in the last few years. Absolutely. Kudos to you first and foremost for this journey and this this amazing achievement that you've been able to create and being able to do it with your husband as business partners. I think you're probably the first person that I've interviewed on here who has actually started, grown, and then sold an organization to start it all over again. That's one thing that I can attest to is I've been on both sides of a transaction from starting a business, growing a business, expanding it and selling it, and then starting all over in the same industry. So it's really, you know, exciting, but yet also bittersweet because of having to have gone through the sale of a company, which, you know, it's like giving away your baby in a way. So I've been through all of it. (laughs) Yeah. And actually, I was just having a conversation with someone not too long ago around the whole mindset of having an exit strategy. Because so many of us, when we start our businesses, it's about building this thing, or it's about sharing our gift, or it's about, you know, serving whatever demographic we want to serve. But oftentimes that thought around, okay, 10 years from now or 15 years from now, am I going to sell it? Like, how do I walk away? What is my exit strategy? So I'm curious, had you already begun to think about an exit strategy before this opportunity came about? Or was it just one of those knock on the doors? Hey, are you selling? Simply stated, it was a phone call to my husband under the guise of that company wanting to do a business development deal with us, which my husband back in 2005 forwarded to me. And I called them up thinking it was a normal business development call. And that conversation soon turned to one of, we want to acquire your company. In no time whatsoever did we have any plans of an exit strategy with my previous company, and we don't have one today. You know, we're entrepreneurs, we're small business owners, and we have this strong passion of building businesses and, you know, taking something out of nothing and building it and growing it. And when you love what you do every day, it's not considered work. So of course, you know, if the right offer came to me today, I would consider it, but I'm not in the business of, you know, having my business for sale. I wasn't in that space back then either. So it was all a really big surprise. (laughs) Yeah, that's awesome. And and maybe at some point later, I'll have you come on and talk about that process because I can imagine a lot of things go on throughout that process. I have a lot of therapy. Let me put it that way. <laughs> I have to go through a lot of therapy. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. So yes, we'll definitely bring you back yes. on to that. But fast forwarding to what you do today, again, kudos to you, over a hundred employees, multi-million dollars in revenue. And especially in this time, especially in these last couple of years where more and more women have 
left corporate or shifted and they've started their own businesses, there's a lot of people starting businesses. And then at the same time, there's a lot of noise and a lot of misinformation around what it takes to start a business. So talk to us about, you know, for the customers or for the clients that come to you, some pitfalls that you've seen, especially in the beginning phases for entrepreneurs who are looking to start their businesses and trying to figure out how do I actually make this a real entity? We've all been through the whole get rich quick phenomenons out there. And if you're looking to get into that get rich quick bandwagon, entrepreneurship, in my opinion, is not for you. True entrepreneurship is, in my opinion, truly having that determination and tenacity and grit of being able to stomach all of the highs and lows that go along in starting a business, growing it, and expanding it. What I can share from my own experience, strength, and hope is that You know, when I first got into entrepreneurship in 1997, I had no idea what I was doing. And frankly, I look back at that time and I think to myself, I really didn't work hard and I was just at the right place at the right time and, you know, had a great idea, grew that idea. And then we were in the right space and got acquired for a large sum of cash And one of the reasons why we were so attractive to the company that acquired us was because we didn't have any debt. You know, it was my husband and I, we were the only shareholders. It was a clean company and it was an easy, clean transaction. I truly look back at how I started my first company versus how I started this company, CorpNet, and I truly feel like my job as an entrepreneur, it was like my higher power was looking at me and going, okay, I gave you one chance. You got off easy. Now I'm really going to test you to see if you have what it takes to truly stay the course. And With CorpNet, when we started this company, it was started, number one, during a period of recession back in 2009, which was at the height of the last recession we were in. And we entered the market when the market was saturated with hundreds of thousands of other document filing companies that were offering similar services to us. And for me, it didn't stop me from entering the company in the face of everyone laughing at me and telling me what a stupid idea it was for me to get back into this industry and how I'm going to lose all my money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. For me, what I can say in response to that is that when you truly believe in something and when you're passionate about what you do, it doesn't matter what people say, because I live with this mantra of there's plenty of business to go around for everyone. As long as you have something that the general public wants, and as long as you can appeal to what they want, they're going to purchase from you. It was that sense of passion and determination that never, ever stopped me in the face of multiple failures after we launched CorpNet. And I think that's a true testament of success and a true testament of what it takes to really be an entrepreneur is that you have to, it's not all rosy posy every day, you know, you're going to have to embrace the highs and embrace the lows. And when you're consistent and, you know, when you're determined and when you're passionate and you believe in something and you don't give up and you show up and you suit up in the face of failure, success is going to follow ultimately. For us, it took about 10 years for us to finally start really experiencing the true taste of success with CorpNet, but it's also the best feeling in the world because you look back and you go, wow, my work really paid off. 
we started CorpNet in this office that I'm sitting in today. And we started it with just three people. It was my husband, myself, and one of our level three service reps in the company and has been with me for over 25 years. She started with me at my first company and then moved over to our current company here at CorpNet. And, uh, you know, we started in this room and then obviously we grew, we moved out into our corporate headquarters and then COVID hit and then we shut down, but we were ready for all of that because when COVID hit, most businesses really didn't know what to do. We were ready in that we were up and running within 24 hours because we always have a plan B and Truly with entrepreneurs, you always have to have a plan B because that's where you know, okay, this is not working. Let's go to plan B. So I'm really proud to say that, you know, I'm very proud of my team, my executive team, my management team as to where we started and where we've come today, because it truly takes a team of great people to make a great company, you know? Absolutely. So a couple of things. Thank you for sharing and being vulnerable around the truth of what it actually takes to be yeah. a entrepreneur in, for the long term. All right. So it's not the highlight reels and it's not the get rich quick things that we see on, on social media, but really rather having a plan, having a strategy, sticking through it and going through those peaks and those valleys and you know digging your heels in the ground to say, I'm still moving forward with this. And it's very interesting that even despite the fact that you had a successful business that was acquired, that second time around, like you still went through the peaks and the valleys. And so as encouragement to anyone who is in maybe a valley space right now, that there is a mountaintop coming, like you just have to dig your heels and continue to grow in that. Um, One of the other pieces that you talked about was your executive team, right? So starting from you and your husband and your level three individual there to really building this out to a hundred people. What was that process like in in terms of removing yourself from this is my baby and this is the day to day to now I'm stepping in the role as CEO and relinquishing control to people whom I trust to run and manage my business. So I've never been a big believer of bringing outside management into my company. I've always been a big believer of, you know, having your company driven by people. And to me, everyone deserves a chance. Yes, it's really great to have a degree. And those are all pluses to have a degree and to have a doctorate degree like myself or a master's degree. But those are cherry on the top of the cake. There are plenty of people who, in my opinion, have a ton of spice and pizzazz and a ton of great ideas that perhaps didn't have the resources to go get a degree, but they have what it takes to, you know, come onto a team and lead a team. So for me, it's always been about inspiring people and mentoring people that have started from the bottom and taking them up. And that's pretty much what my management team is about today. Everyone that is a part of my management team has started with me at some, you know, lower level, whether it was in an admin type of a level or sales capacity or customer service or fulfillment. And I'm proud to say that that's also a testament to a company being successful is because a successful company is really driven by the employees of that company. When your employees are happy, they're going to do everything in their power to make that company successful. And for me, that's always been important in that I don't treat my employees like numbers. I treat them as humans. I don't treat them as commodities. I actually treat them as humans where I know them by name and I'm able to communicate with them. And that is a sign 
that person is valued as a human. And oftentimes, you know, the culture within my company is one of a family environment. And it's kept that nature of being a family environment, regardless of whether we've been a 10% company, a 50% company, or a 100% company. Even to this day, in the face of what we've been through in the last couple of years, I still maintain a connection with my team by having a town hall meeting every other month so that there is connection with the team. And that's what really, in my opinion, drives a company towards success because it's all about the people. You know, when your employees are happy, they're going to do whatever it takes to contribute to the success of that company. Absolutely. You've hit on so many things there. And I love, I love the philosophy that you have around, you know, really building up your people. And so building them up from whatever level that they start on to actually grow, develop, mentor, give them the skills so that they can step into leadership roles because they've done the, you know, lower level work, right? They know how to better support, you know, individuals who will be in that role that they can manage. And because they've seen different variations of the levels within the organization, they have a broader view. And I imagine would not be as like siloed to say, okay, this is what sales does. And this is what fulfillment does, but they've had enough or breadth of experience throughout the organization where they can contribute in a larger capacity. And you mentioned this earlier in terms of when COVID hit, you know, you had a contingency plan in place. You were able to be back and up and running. Now that things have shifted and, you know, people are going back into the office, how are you managing as a CEO or making decisions around what the workforce looks like? Is it a hybrid workforce? How are you navigating this new pivot? Well, it's funny that you asked that because before COVID hit, we had employees that, you know, we considered such an integral part of our company that, you know, unfortunately due to life's challenges, they had decided to move. And because they loved working for the company, they had come and asked us whether we would be open to offering them a remote position. So the idea of having people remote for us was something that came into play before the pandemic hit. We're a 50 state document filing service where we provide services in all 50 states. So we went back to our team, to our management team, and we thought, you know, this is a good win-win for both parties. So we decided to open up remote access into the corporate headquarters by offering remote positions to our employees. So when that happened, we were already set up remote employment for anyone at the click of a button. So when the pandemic took place, I remember, you know, there was a notice that we were having to be shut down on a Thursday. And by Friday, we were up and running because Truly, everyone literally just picked up their computers and went home and then logged into a VPN and had access to everything. And we're a paperless company, so it's really easy for us. Now that the pandemic has been under control, we really realized, okay, you know, why don't we make it even more attractive to our employees and offer them the option of either staying remote or coming back into corporate headquarters. And it has been a mix. You know, some people like to be around others. And so they work in our corporate headquarters. However, you know, we're also able to attract more talent and a bigger pool of talent by being a remote oriented company and offering our services to all 50 states, but also attracting employees in all 50 states. So for us, the pandemic has been a win-win. It hasn't really affected us. In fact, the pandemic helped us grow as a company and be able to provide even more options to our employees. Yeah, that's a really great point. I'm happy to hear that you had that set up. Yeah, and I think there's another message from this is that people tend to look at things in life as a negative, you know, which 
for me, when things happen, I don't like to push any type of religion on anyone. So I feel like when things happen, it's really the universe working its magic. Personally, I like to embrace those because I feel like, you know what, there's something better that's going to come out. Everything happens for a reason. So that's always been my mentality in life. And knock on wood, it's always been a blessing for me, you know, and I, you know, pray to God that it stays that way. And I'm very lucky to say that we've been at the right place at the right time and been prepared. Yeah, I love that perspective. As you know, they keep saying there's a talent shortage, but we know the truth is that there's not a talent shortage. It's just, you know, employees are demanding different things right now. And so you've made a really great point that in creating that flexibility where you're giving your employees the choice of, hey, come into the office, relocate somewhere else, work from home. It's actually benefited the organization versus restricted it or somehow tampered with the culture that you had already established. And I think that's an important thing to highlight because I know there are a lot of organizations, big and small, who are struggling. There are parts of them that want to go back to what, you know, the normal was and then really trying to adapt. Well, how can we make this work? I'm happy to hear with a team of 100 spread out throughout the entire country that there are companies who are making this work. You know, there is pluses and minuses to everything. Being a remote organization obviously has its perks, but from a company standpoint, there has to be more management as well. We've had to add and open up more, you know, positions for leadership or lead roles because being a remote company Obviously, you have those people that are very self-driven and self-motivated, but then you have the people that need to be managed a little bit more. So it has its give and takes, but overall, for us, it seems to work better. Yeah, that's a really great point. And so just shifting gears here, obviously, you're helping to support small businesses, making sure that legally they're protected, they have their, you know, ducks in a row, so to speak. Is there anything that you're noticing in the market right now, in terms of like missteps? I think there's still this lack of awareness that there are ways that you can start a business without spending a lot of money to start a business. And the lack of awareness is that if I need to, if I want to start a business, I need to go to an attorney to get them to help me with the paperwork. And that's not the case. An attorney is great. And I think it would be great to have an attorney on hand when you really need the attorney to provide you with legal advice. But starting a business by filing paperwork at the Secretary of State's office does not require the retainment of counsel or an attorney. You can simply go online yourself and do it on your own. I would recommend against that in light of, you know, having a reputable, com- a reputable company such as our company, CorpNet, that can assist you with all of those steps and more for fees that are less than $500 simply having someone like our company help you with all the steps required to start a business, whether it's to set yourself up as a sole proprietorship or a partnership, or if you, you know, decided to go and legalize your company as a corporation or an LLC, our company can assist you with all of those steps and more in all 50 states for a fraction of a price at one-tenth of a price of what an attorney would cost you. And obviously that's for those who are starting. What about for those who have an established business and maybe they started off as an LLC and now they're considering, you know, an S-corp or something like that. I assume that you help them through that process in that different ways as well. Yeah. So we're a one-stop business filing service. We not only assist with setting up corporations and LLCs for new business owners and entrepreneurs, but we also cater to existing business owners and entrepreneurs who have an established business entity, who want to expand their business into other states, who want to convert their business entity type from an LLC to a C-Corp, from a C-Corp to an S-Corp, from an S-Corp to a C-Corp, 
we help with everything and anything when it comes to starting, maintaining, managing, running, expanding, and growing a business in all 50 states. Awesome. Thank you for that, Nelly. And then one, maybe two final questions for you. So I'm a firm believer and, you know, my Audible and my Amazon wish list. <laughs> <laughs> prove it that you know part of being an effective leader part of being an effective entrepreneur or you know taking on any initiative really requires you to educate yourself so in terms of that that for me that's reading and that's podcast obviously but i'm just curious are, are there any books or is there one book that has been pivotal for you in terms of helping you advance as a leader or as a business owner and entrepreneur so one of my dear friends and colleagues who unfortunately lost his life a couple of years ago, Tony Shea, he was the CEO of Zappos. He had a book out called Delivering Happiness. That's a book that is considered a Bible for me. There's a book called Seven, highly, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. That's another great one. The Gifts of Imperfection by Brene Brown, all of Brene Brown's books, in my opinion, you can't go wrong with that. As a CEO and founder and an, as an entrepreneur, I'm always looking to get better and striving to become a better leader, better mother, better wife, you know, better mentor. So I'm always educating myself. So you can't go wrong by reading and listening to podcasts. And I think part of that also is, you know, what do you do for spirituality? You know, because you have to shut off your mind. There has to be a period where you're shutting off your mind. So definitely a huge proponent of meditation, quieting the mind, you know, sitting in stillness, because those are the moments where you get those aha moments and where you get to come up with your great ideas. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so final question for you, you said there was a different requirements for you from, you know, the Nelly that started the business in 1997 to the one who started the business in 2009. So if you could go back to 1997, fresh out of school, like ready to start this business and give her advice, give her one key piece of advice that you learned throughout this journey of entrepreneurship, what would that be? I would say no is a complete answer. <laughs> and it's it. okay. It's okay to say no to people and it's okay to let people have their feelings. And that's what I would tell to myself. I was very naive back in 1997 and I have become a little bit more seasoned and, you know, smarter as to who I consider my tribe and who I consider my inner circle, and who I consider people that, you know, I just have shared interests with. I love that. Being able to compartmentalize your relationships and your network. And speaking of, because, you know, I can't not talk about networking, how do you incorporate networking into, you know, your business and your personal development and your personal growth? Networking is a part of my daily life. Whether I'm at a shopping mall, whether I am at a grocery market, grocery store, whether I'm at a kid's football game or a basketball game or a dance recital, I'm always networking because you never know who you run into and make sure that you're representing yourself in a way that you want to be seen by other people. And Make sure that's a consistent representation of yourself, whether you're out in the real world, you know, in the neighborhood, or it's on social media. I'm on every platform that you can find me, whether it's Google, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And I try to keep it very consistent daily. It's a daily thing. You can't half-ass it. <laughs> agreed, agreed. And speaking of that, how can people reach out to you? So you gave the information for, for those who may need the services, but how can they connect with you, reach out to you and become part of your network? Absolutely. So I am on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. You can follow me on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram 
at Nellie Account. You can reach out to us at www.corpnet.com or you can send us an email to info at corpnet.com. Well, thank you so much, Nellie. It's been very informative, especially for those of us who, you know, are a few years in and knowing that, you know, what you're experiencing is normal and that there's light at the end of the tunnel. So thank you so much for sharing that. And certainly I encourage you to connect with Nellie. All of her social handles, as well as the website and the information will be in the show notes. Let her know that you heard her on the She Leads Now podcast. We will be back next week with another amazing powerhouse. Until then, have a fabulous week. Take care. Thank you, Sabine. Thank you, Nellie. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of She Leads Now. If you found today's episode helpful or got a piece of insight that you plan to implement in your business or organization, I would love to hear from you. Connect with me on LinkedIn at Sabine Gideon, that's my handle, and send me a private message or feel free to go ahead and leave a review on either Apple or Spotify. I also invite you to share this episode with anyone in your network who you think might benefit from this content. Lastly, be sure to check the show notes and the description below for links to resources, including relevant downloads, articles, and any upcoming training. Until we chat again, have a blessed and powerful week.